Hi, everybody. Welcome to the pre-concert chat for our virtual concert for the spring. We're so excited to see you here. And I have some amazing humans to talk to here about this upcoming concert. So let's start with who I see on my screen first. Um, Blaine, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everybody. I'm Blaine Barnes. I'm a violinist and uh, co-founder of NOCO. And next, I have Ruthie Nicholas. Hi, I'm Ruthie. I'm a visual artist and illustrator. And I helped, or I worked on the introduction artwork for each of the composers. And we have Janet Putnam. Hi. Um, wow. I'm Janet Putnam. I'm an oboist and here to talk. Great. And sorry, you cut out there. Um, uh, we'll keep going. Ke Kelly. Kelly Moore. Hi. Hi, my name is Kelly Moore, and I'm a violist with NOCO, and also um, am currently leader of the marketing committee. And yeah, excited to chat with everyone about their experiences getting ready for this concert. Great. And Ramon, and you'll want to unmute. Oh, perfect. You got it. Hi, I'm Ramon. I'm a double bassist in NOCO, and I'm somewhat new to the group and just really happy to, to be playing with you guys. It's great to be here. It's great. And I'm Tori Parker. I am also a co-founder and um, violinist with NOCO. So let's get started with, um, how about Blaine, if you want to talk a little bit about the Rossini. We're doing a Rossini overture tonight um, that has a lot of members um, playing. And so if you want to talk about the piece, the composer, the recording experience, anything, that sounds good. Sure. Um... Yeah, uh, Il Signor Bruschino, uh, Rossini wrote this opera in 1813. Um, it's a one act comic opera. It's one of his earliest. Um, he was 21 when he wrote it. So I just keep thinking like what I was doing when I was 21, it was like, you know, could I, could I do a load of laundry yet? I don't know, maybe not. Um, it was not successful at its premiere. Uh, but it's gone on to be the most performed one-act comic opera of Rossini's today. Um, Rossini went on to write like 40 some odd operas. He was wildly successful during his lifetime, uh, so successful that he was able to retire, uh, semi-retire by the time he was 38. <laughs> Another thing that has passed me by. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the synopsis for this opera is ridiculous. Um, I was thinking about how I would even summarize it and I'm not going to bother. <laughs> so if you're interested in, in reading about it, go ahead. I mean, there's people impersonating other people. There's someone being detained by a tavern owner because of a gambling debt. There's like a, a young woman being promised her hand being promised in marriage to a, a man she's never met. So that's just absurd. I always think of operas like this as being kind of like a Three's Company episode set to music. <laughs> so hopefully, you know, I, I'm sure I just aged, I dated myself with that reference. Um, I love it. And, <laughs> and one thing that, that you'll see in the video is uh, it's a compositional technique or a, sorry, a violinistic or a string playing technique called coleno, where the strings, or in this case, specifically the second violins will tap the strings with the, the wood of the, of the bow, um, just like this. So that happens throughout the overture. Um, I'm not sure I looked up why he did that. And there's, all I can think of is he was young and he thought it was interesting. He thought it was cool. Um, and I'm not going to give too much away, but uh, uh, we did not use bows <laughs> during this. Uh, I mean, for the playing part, sure, but not the playing. <laughs> so you'll see. I won't give too much away. Yeah, um, we kept with the comedy a little bit, the comic vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the opera. Um, the recording process was fun. I got to do it with Tori and Tori makes everything fun. 
She's very forgiving. <laughs> She's very understanding. Um, Nothing to forgive. Oh, that was funny. <laughs> Super uh, fun. Yeah, I made the mistake of um, I was I had my music on the iPad, and I had, it was the first time I was going to use my pedals to turn the page. And so I don't. For those of you who don't know, you know you can play and I can, you know, use your feet to turn the, the page. And I didn't really plan out my page turns. <laughs> and so I had a page turn in like two of my page turns were during the worst, most difficult part. <laughs> so I, I kind of felt like I was, had to tap dance while I was playing. And it, it actually, that made me more nervous than the actual recording process. So there you go. But we made it through and it was awesome. It was super fun. Yeah. Hey. Great. It was so nice. Go ahead, Kelly. Oh, no, it was just so nice as someone who also participated in the Rossini. It was so nice to have that click track. So I really appreciate all of the work that you guys did putting it together um, because it made um, my process. And of course, with the help of Philip and in his studio, um, made the process really easy. So I'm grateful for all the time that you guys put into that. Yeah. Yeah. Tempo map that was, that was, yeah. And it was really fast. That was fun. Yeah, that was, I, you know, I think Tori and I and Eli, who was the first person to record the cellist, um, had the easiest part. We just got to do it. And <laughs> I think everybody else had to suffer through trying to like find the click and <laughs> enter right on time. So I'm sure we'll hear from Ramon about maybe the, the difficulty of listening to the click track. But Yes. In fact, that's a great segue. Ramon, do you want to say anything about the process and the piece? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I wanted to add to um, what Blaine had was talking about with the Colenio. Um, I had never heard the piece before. So I actually asked a couple friends about um, the piece and if they knew anything about it. And I don't know if it's if it's been proven. I think it may just be a story. But Rossini may have thought that the overture was going to be a giant flop. And so uh, for some comedic relief, he wanted the music, uh, musicians to actually tap the candelabra on, on the stands with their sticks instead of actual Colenio. So just as something to laugh at for the audience to look at. So, um, so I thought that was humorous. And all the stories that you hear about Rossini and his sense of humor, it just kind of, kind of matched with that. Um, the recording process was actually was, was pretty easy, you know, um, it helps to, to play with, uh, well, with good musicians, just like yourself, uh, the click track definitely helped. And then, um, the recording, the actual recording day, uh, when I was in the studio, I got to play with Kevin and that was, that was a real treat. So actually just playing music with anybody, you know, other than the occasional duet with the student is, is a real treat. So. <laughs> especially this year it, it was really special to just like get in the studio even though we had to be masked and everything but it was so amazing yeah so yeah I'm glad, I'm glad that we got to do this in little pods yeah mm -hmm. people had to record from home which is totally fine too but you'll see in the video it's pretty fun you can see kind of where everyone's located and kind of awesome <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Um, let's shift on to the Andreessen. Janet, do you want to talk a little bit about the Andreessen and maybe the recording process as well? I know you, well, and you also played in the Rossini, so yeah, talk about whatever. Sure. The, the Andreessen, not a whole lot is um, available to find out about him, but his father and uncle were composers in the Netherlands and they were pretty well known. And his brother also composed music, but he primarily composed theater music <clears throat> and was influenced by folk music from different cultures and uh, American film music and Aaron Copeland's ballets. He um, ended up writing a lot of film music, film music when he was in Paris. Um, he studied with Messiaen. <laughs> So interesting influences there. And he, he did a lot of, um, 
he did some serialism and some neoclassicism. So that's kind of what I know about him. <laughs> but the the piece at Renaissance dance, and it's just fun. I mean, it's just fun to play. And we thought at first that it was going to be completely remote because being wind players, you know, those droplets, the aerosols spread. And so uh, even distanced, it didn't feel very safe, but we ended up um, having some really sunny days, some warm days, and we were able to rehearse on my back deck um, where there's lots of room. And and um, that was, it, it was the first rehearsal, gosh, in 15 months. So just incredible. <laughs> I mean, moment to moment appreciating getting to play chamber music with these amazing musicians. Um, and so there was that. And then we wanted to try and do things remotely, but it was going to, it just wasn't going to work. We ended up, um, when we recorded, four of us were vaccinated and one was not fully vaccinated. And so Stephen Morgan, the bassoonist, went in first to record all of his parts. And then the rest of us went in a couple days later to record our parts. And that was interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's because um, we were hearing the click track and Stephen, and it was just a little weird to have all the rest of us there. And, and it was almost like, wait, Steven is here, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Um, but just a thrill to get to play with people and especially these, um, these wonderful NOCO colleagues, it, it's a thrill. I'm so glad that it was able to be worked out. I'm so happy. And I, I know you, four of you did two different pieces on the same recording session. So I'm sure you were extremely tired because you also recorded the Maunders. And the I didn't realize um, that the Andreessen is like, was it like six movements or something? So yeah, I, 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 I'm very grateful that you were able to push through that session. That sounds like that was... It was, it was pretty it was pretty demanding in terms of endurance but um but so worth it you know just to do those two pieces um, and it was it was so worth it so it was a pleasure that's great all right well thanks for talking about that um Kelly do you want to talk a little bit about the Ina Boyle quartet Sure. So um, I had the pleasure of working on the first movement of a quartet by a composer named Ina Boyle. Um, and we, the people involved with that were Tori and Claire, who I don't think you guys can see. She's helping make all of this possible. But um, so Tori, Claire, myself, and Kevin uh, worked on this quartet. And it was, it was so much fun um, to get to actually rehearse. I've had a couple chances to sight read with friends and stuff throughout the pandemic, but it was so nice to really get to work on something with people um, and have a, a performance goal, which for me, this is the first thing that had come up since all of this started. So uh, it was really, really fun to have that opportunity. Um, Claire was the one responsible for finding this quartet. I don't think any of us had ever heard of this composer, um, Ina Boyle. And it sounds like, so Claire sent me some information um, since she's busy making all of um, all of our live stream and YouTube um, broadcasting work. Um, she had a student that she was working with and she asked that student to find some violin works by female composers that neither of them had ever heard of. And the student brought a violin concerto by Ina Boyle to them and they started working on it and finding out more about her. Um, as you'll, I think you might be able to read a little bit about Ina on her intro card, but, um, Ina lived in Ireland for most of her life and she had the chance to work with Rafe Fun Williams a little bit. He was a mentor for her. Um, so that's good that she was able to get some guidance, I'm guessing as a female composer. Um, she didn't get a lot of help or credit or opportunity, um, during that time. So it's glad that Von, I'm glad that Von Williams was able to work with her a little bit. Um, Claire was able to find the music from a nonprofit that had digital parts. 
um, that they had probably created from a manuscript. And she just emailed them and um, spoke with the person, I think, who was responsible for creating the parts. And um, yeah, so she she found us the score and the everything. Um, and this quartet was dedicated to Anne McNaughton, who was the first violinist in the premiere of the piece. And it sounds like um, they had an all-female string quartet in London in the 1930s, which is um, pretty radical. So um, it's cool to, to learn about that history of those that have come before us. So yeah, it was it was really was fun to rehearse. Yeah, it was fun to rehearse and to record. And like Janet was talking about, I mean, if they were if they recorded two pieces, I can't imagine how long that took. Um, you know, as a string player, I feel kind of out of shape, you know, playing for longer than a half hour is not something I've done in a long time. And having a three or four hour recording session was really exhausting um, when normally that that would be normal for us. So I don't know. It was it's funny the things that you start to notice. But yeah, it was it was a, a really fun project and I hope that we get to work on the rest of it yes. soon. Thank you. And yeah, I will say that with the recording sessions, although we had these long sessions, we just took the best take out of the entire section se sessions. So we wanted to keep it as close to live as possible for this concert. So nothing is really like too spliced or edited or anything like that. Um, so it's mixed and mastered, but yeah, so that was, that was a challenge to find, okay, well, where's our favorite take? Let's, let's choose that. <laughs> um, so let's hear a little bit from Ruthie, the artist, the visual artist, um, about what, she, what, what you did for this concert. Well, I, I made an introduction illustration for each of the composers, and it's actually really nice to hear all of you talk about them because before I did my artwork, I did a little bit of research, but and I listened to the pieces, but with everything going on, I didn't have a lot of time to really delve into who each of these composers were. I just was kind of working on, okay, I know a few little things about them, and then I would take a portrait of their face and their name and just start making lines and picking colors and until I had an image. And I've been using um, an iPad and a program called Procreate. So I have been able to make all my illustrations digitally, which has been a new thing for me, but also a really inspiring new medium. And so, um, I did that with all of these images and, and there's actually some features that you can do animations. And one of them is more of a traditional, you make each frame and like animate something. But the one I used basically just records my drawings or my images or paintings or whatever you wanna call them as I'm making them. And then it, it gives us the time-lapse um, video that shows the making of that image. And so I kind of played around with that and I it took me a minute of experimentation and, and then I started coming up with these portraits and, and you'll see the animations at the beginning of each concert or at the end of each composer's piece. And um, yeah, so that's basically what I, I've been working on. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, I'm so excited to see them and they're beautiful. I mean, I've seen them already, but I'm excited to see the concert because it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Each one, some of them have some in inspiration from like the Rossini one. I found out that he was from Italy and it lived near the Adriatic. And so I included some colors that I thought were kind of reminiscent of that. And some of the others I did things like that as well. But mostly I just went with my gut and created something that I thought would be interesting and it felt in in a way as I look back on it I was because I've never done animation before or a video that I was going to share publicly so it was kind of in a way like learning how to compose my my normally flat illustrations as a as something that had a beginning and a middle and an end and it was it was interesting <laughs> 
Well, thank you for trying this new medium with us and I am so excited to see it. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, we should probably try to wrap it up soon, but does anyone else have any thoughts or things they wanna share before we move on to the actual concert? Seems like it, Kelly, did you have something? Oh, well, yeah, and I saw Janet raise her hand too, but I just wanted to say, I think this concert is really wonderful. Um, a lot of the composers I'd never heard of before. And um, I think sometimes they're composers from 300 years ago that we, we don't hear about maybe because their music wasn't as good. And sometimes it's because they were at a disadvantage. So I love um, hearing about new composers. And even better, I love how many living composers are on this concert. I think that's really exciting and uh, important to give um, to give exposure to those pieces and to let people know that classical music is not just um, from the past, but it's something that's still happening. So I'm really excited to hear all of these amazing new pieces that are being featured. Absolutely. Janet, did you have something? Yeah, um, I, I just want to say the first time I heard the playthrough of the Rossini, the string parts, I thought it was on like fast speed. <laughs> I thought it was like, I, you're too young, Tori, but it was like um, the 78s we had at our house. <laughs> you know, it was like we put it on a 45 and it was on 78 speed. Sure. <laughs> I thought, how are we going to do this? Um, but but it was fun and I'm really looking forward to hearing the string pieces and everything put together. Um, and I also, I don't know, I still want to play with everybody in person. Probably we all do. Yes, yes, soon, hopefully soon. Yes. Does anyone else have any final thoughts before we move to the next thing? We have a video, um, a couple of videos of Libby Larson and also Florence Maunders talking about their pieces. So we'll reserve those. We won't talk about those now. We'll reserve that for them to talk about their own pieces. But thank you all for being here. I'm so excited to hear the concert and we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye.
Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our season finale concert tonight. My name is Kelly Moore and I'm a violist with NOCO as well as leader of the marketing committee. Our concerts would not be possible without the support of our generous donors. So thank you so much to everyone who supported us over the years and especially over the last year. It really means the world to us. If you're interested in supporting NOCO, you can visit our website at noco.org slash donate. Another great way that you can support us is by following along online. We have our YouTube channel, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. So we hope to see you on there. Before the concert begins, we're going to hear from composers Libby Larson and Florence Maunders speak a little bit about their pieces that are featured on tonight's program. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the concert. Hi, I'm Libby Larson, and I'm the composer of the piece Corker for clarinet and percussion. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my inspiration for the piece. I wrote this piece in 1989, uh, uh, and I was interested very much in how the language that we speak, American English, finds itself into the music that we compose, the rhythms, the syntax, all the things that we use to express ourselves um, with the American language. Um, I came across a slang term, it's a, it's a term I've known for a long time, and the term is called corker. We usually say, oh, that's a real corker. Uh, and what that means uh, is something that is just astonishing, just exciting and astonishing, and just beyond what you could imagine. We call that a real corker. So when I thought to create a piece for clarinet and percussion, I uh, thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if I can uh, use the tremendous ability of the clarinet to be uh, dexterous uh, and agile uh, uh, and, and rhythmic and, and expressive, almost vocally expressive. I wonder if I can use uh, those qualities and create a piece of astonishing brilliance for clarinet and to percussion, uh, which I set about to do and you are about to hear in my piece called Corker. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Hi there, I'm Florence Maunders. I'm a composer. I live and work in the UK. And I'm here to talk very quickly to you about my piece, Fleeting Images for Wind Quintet. So this is a short piece of music, it's about five minutes long. And the first half and the second half are very different to each other. The first half is a series of gently expanding, flowing kind of lyrical sections that explore the sort of gentle rhythmic interplay between patterns of three groups of three and nine groups of two notes. So um, when, they, when they overlap, you get this gentle accentuation of offbeats and, and offbeat pulsations. So the whole music's gently pulsating the whole time. And the harmony for this opening section is um, it's very spacious. It's all based around thirds and sixths. Um, in fact, the, the whole harmonic language for this first half is, is very much sort of inspired by 1960s, 1970s jazz funk music. I mean, it, the music doesn't have a jazz funk feel at all, but it, it is that kind of very open harmony. Um, and a lot of it's inverted, so it's kind of stacked with um, fourths or elevenths at the bottom of the chord. So it's got this really kind of open, fresh feel. The second half of the piece, though, is completely contrasting. Um, it's much more driven rhythmically. Um, it's still pulsating, but the pulsation um, is fiercer. It's it's more rapid, and um, there's this kind of um, polyrhythmic groove, whether it's two against three or two against um, six or six against four the whole time. So it's it's got this kind of um, almost dubstep or halftime feel to it. So there is a lot of influence in my music from the world of electronic dance music, and I think it comes across more clearly in the second half of this piece. Although harmonically and sort of the melodic material in, in it owes a, a big debt as well to uh, folk music from perhaps um, sort of Lebanon region, um, Syria and um, South um, Eastern Turkey, so maybe into Kurdistan. So it's got that kind of 
harmonic rhythmic flavor though i haven't used the kind of microtonal tunings you'll, you'll find in the music of that region you'll recognize the particularly the distinctive um, way it approaches a, a, a fixed pitch and the way it works against that like a flattened second degree and um, the piece then kind of bounces along in the second half and builds up to, to quite a fierce climax at the end of the piece. Well, thank you very much for listening and I hope you very much enjoy listening to Fleeting Images. Thank you.
Thanks again for joining us and we hope you enjoyed the concert. If you want to see more programming like this, please consider supporting us at noco.org donate. Thanks again and have a good night.